can get it online through Wilkinson Publishing, and I'll say it's Mugshots One, and it's got Mr. Crow yeah. written on the front there. Beautiful. So sorry, just for the document. It's all good. Just for the documentary, can you would just state your name and your title and occupation as well, please. Keith Moore, journalist and true crime author. Beautiful. So getting right into it, given how Mr. Cruel struck around the late 80s and 90s where journalism doesn't have the benefits that the internet and technology presents like today. So say with the idea of anonymity and tips and as well as the rise of citizen journalism, um, how important was media back then in terms of just the general idea as well as more specifically towards the Mr. Cruel case? Look, it was still very significant in that obviously it was huge news um, um, from 1988 was, was the first time that, you know, the Sharon Wills abduction, um, as you probably were, she was kept for 18 hours. So there was, you know, TV press conferences, the newspapers were full of it. And yes, there wasn't social media, but back then, newspapers in particular and TVs had such a much more massive audience than they do now. Obviously, social media, people are getting their news more from your Facebooks and other places, but back then, everybody turned to the nightly news and everybody bought the Herald and everybody bought the Sun and the Age and uh, each of those, and radio as well, obviously, and each of those mediums carried a lot of publicity along the lines of um, appeals from the parents, for example, and, and the reason that the police like the media to do those things is that obviously you hope that the perpetrator has something in his heart that he might, if he is watching TV and he sees the parents of a 10 year old girl that he's abducted, weeping and wailing, you just hope that there might be some sentiment within him that he might think, well, yes, I'll release her. And that, you know, that's why police do it and that's why the media do it. And it, it, it's obviously very important to get um, any witnesses in that, you know, you give the best description you can, you, can, you, um, you, sp you speak to neighbours and, and it really does just take that one called the Crime Stoppers. Nobody, the police don't know what they're looking for. They don't know what people might have seen and nor do the media. So you just put as much information as you can in, in whether it's a radio report, a TV report or a newspaper report or now on social media, um, as much information as you can in the hope that somebody thinks, oh yes, I was driving past that house that night and I did see somebody walking out of it. And it's that little bit of information that allows police to build up the jigsaw that they need to uh, hopefully catch the man. Although in this case, obviously, they never did. Yeah, yeah. well, f further from that point as well, um, when you talk about how important the media was, and obviously that you were reliant on calls coming in, how hard was it distinguishing information about the case from potential tips from sources knowing that it could be true or it could just be a scared resident's paranoia about a killer on the loose because he was something that was affecting like you know very neighborhood like friendly residents as well so how like yeah oh uh, look i think it's certainly the early stages of an abduction like that the police obviously expect that a lot of the calls to crime stoppers and a lot of the calls to the media aren't going to be correct but you just you're just going for as much possible information as you can because you know the the, the, the first 24 hours, 36 hours of any book like that are the most important in that you've, you've really got to get as much information out there as you can. So I certainly can see nothing wrong with with um, some false information. You don't know it's false. You, I'd like to think no responsible journalist would, would ever put something out that they knew was false. But uh, obviously a lot of the information that does come in from, from conferences and following up newspaper articles like that isn't necessarily going to be right. You, you, you obviously, as time went on with the Mr. Cruel case, certainly there was a lot of um, a lot of disaffected girlfriends and wives that decided to dob in their boyfriends and husbands because you know they used to love them and then they started hating them, or their husbands beat them, or they were suspicious about them. So a lot of it, it look, it was malicious, but you cut the police and the media can't really afford to ignore uh, such information because you know until you check it out, you don't know whether it's correct or not. But I certainly would like to think no responsible journalist would put deliberately put out uh, wrong information. Yeah. Well, speaking of, like, when you were appointed Chief of Staff of the Herald Sun in 1990, how big of a focal point or priority was the Mr. Cruel case? Oh, look, it, it, it got bigger. I mean, obviously, the, the first one was big news. She was returned relatively unharmed after 18 hours. It really kicked up again when Nicola Lyon was, was taken. That was uh, 19, 1990. 
Um, it was a bigger story then because, of course, she was kept for 50 hours before she was released. And then it really kicked up when Carmen Chan was taken the following year. And yeah. As we was know... There any, yeah. Was there any sort of, like, lingering feeling? Because he was kind of known or had a lingering possibility he might be the Hampton murderer, for example. Like, was media back then kind of portraying that as just a random stringent of murders that wasn't connected to Mr. Cruel until they put it together eventually? Or... Was there a feeling of Mr. C that was Mr. Cool, but they didn't put a, def a definitive kind of um, name to it? Yes, late in the some, there are some detectives that worked on the case that still don't think that it was Mr. Cruel that did common chance, simply because he did release all of the others relatively unharmed. Um, obviously, you know, mentally, but physically they were they were in good condition, and he did release them all. And uh, and and. The difference with Common Chan is, of course, he, he killed her. Um, but they had to treat it as a Mr. Krill case because there were so many similarities. Thank heavens there aren't many cases where a masked man armed with a knife or a gun breaks into a house and takes away a child and keeps them for a certain amount of time. It, it is incredibly rare for that to happen. And because there were so many similarities with the Common Chan case to the others, it had to be treated as a Mr. Krill case and was and still is to this day, but there are certainly some others that think it was so out of character for him to kill her. But the counter argument to that is, I've spoken of Phyllis Chan a lot, who's the mother of Carmen Chan and the detectives, and, and Carmen was a particularly feisty 13 year old. And according to her mom, she, any chance she got, she would have ripped off his mask. And you know, so imagine if she did do that, and he was very careful with the other victims, Exactly, yeah. To never be seen. They were either blindfolded or he was wearing a mask. So once, if she did do that, uh, he probably had no choice but to kill her in that she'd seen his face. So if he releases it the way he's released the others, then he's exposing himself to, to going to jail forever. So there is a school of thought, both among psychologists and police, that uh, he reluctantly killed Carmen Chan. Um, yeah. As we know, there are no, they don't think he's offended since then. Uh, some detectives think that he got such a shock at A, having to do something he didn't want to do, which is kill Carmen Chan, um, that he stopped offending. But that sort of offender doesn't usually just stop. They need to be caught or they need to be killed. But it's possible that he flies to Bali or Cambodia or the Philippines three times a year and hires somebody to dress up as a schoolgirl. Maybe that's how he gets his kicks now. I mean, who knows? The problem is, of course, he's, he's never been caught, so there's got to be a lot of supposition. But certainly the Spectrum Task Force had to treat the 11-year-old girl who's never been named um, from 1987 and, okay, the three, yeah. and the three named victims. They've always, yeah. those four has been Mr. Cruel. They think he might have done about 12 others um, going way back to, you know, the early 1980s. Um, yeah. because of the, the modus operandi. Um, but look, there's a chance he didn't do all of them because he was just yeah. so incredibly good at, uh, at you know, not leaving any clues behind. Yeah, and that's the thing about what kind of gets me into this whole conversation, especially with someone that is specifically leaving clues, knowing that it would catch media attention. And during, like, it would catch media attention eventually. Um, during that research period, did you picture or theorize what kind of person who would be capable of such crimes? Like, did you kind of form like a character profile from like a media perspective, or were you going more along the lines of what the police had as well? A bit of both. Um, and look, the one thing, that, and it was unavoidable, but the one thing that I guess if there's anything I feel guilty about is the actual title, Mr. Cruel. Police have always hated it because. The minute you call somebody Mr. Cruel, it conjures up an image of an evil man sneaking out of an X-rated shop with a trilby hat on and a waistcoat. Yeah. On. And it, it makes I mean, you think, whereas in actual fact, he's probably a kindly gentleman who puts the next door neighbor's rubbish out because she's that, in yeah. and, and, and But the problem is once he was called Mr. Cruel, that name stuck. Um, now, having said that, you know, there's, it, 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 it is a trait of the media. You know, you've got your Mr. Baldies, your Mr. Stinkies, your Silver Gun Rapists. So, it, it, we, you know, you, we like to put labels on things and it identifies the crime and the criminal. But I certainly, in everything I've written, have, have sort of tried to point out that he's probably not to look at. You wouldn't think, wow, Mr. Cruel is a good name for him. He's, he could just as easily be a nice, meek and mild person. 
And what the police, why the police want that point of date, and it's why I have in almost everything I've written, is what they don't want is Mrs. Smith to be thinking, oh, that bloke next door is a bit strange sometimes, but he's really nice to Mrs. Jones. And, and you know, you sometimes get to, what you don't want is her to not pick up the phone and say it might be Mr. Smith because Mr. Smith doesn't look like a Mr. Cruel. So look, the Mr. Cruel tag is something everybody's stuck with now and the police accept that, but they would have preferred that we'd call him something else. Yeah. Well, coming from the more towards the for Carmen Chan, um, she was missing for roughly a year as well. Was there much to go for in this period of time in terms of finding her? And if so, how much information or evidence was found during that time of her abduction? Uh, look, there was a, a lot of information um, put out after that, and the media played an important role in that, in that obviously they couldn't interview Carmen um, because she was never released, but both of the girls that were able to, you know, Sharon Wills and Nicola Linus, were both incredible witnesses. They were, they were spoken to for hours upon hours, and they both had information about hearing aeroplanes uh, probably landing. Um, uh, they managed to sneak a look at both the bathroom they were using and also the bedroom that they were in to give descriptions of them. And there were relatively unusual things about those rooms. So um, the police put out that information and, you know, it was, it was something like 37,000 houses underneath the flight path sort of leading towards Tullamarine Airport that had to be searched because, you know, they were looking for the, dis the distinctive um, wash basin that the girls had described, that sort of stuff. And again, the media played an important role in keeping that in the public eye in that, in that obviously the other two cases were finished in 18 hours and 50 hours. I mean, yes, for a couple of days afterwards, it was, it was still page one news, but then it tended to die off. But because Carmen wasn't returned and her body wasn't found for a year later, police and the media were looking to bring it before the public's eye again um, so the, the police working with the media, uh, first of all, released the FBI profile. That was a big story. Then they released the stuff about uh, the, the bathroom. Then they released the stuff about the, the flight paths. And, it, and it's all aimed at not having the story just disappear off the front pages and off the TV news. So look, there was a, a, a lot of cooperation between the police and the media to get as, as, much, as, as many facts out there as possible again with the view that somebody will just pick up the phone and ring crime stoppers. Mm, mm. Well, speaking of, did you feel any type of pressure that the case was going nationwide and that the Herald Sun is a Melbourne-based publication at the time that you were chief of staff to kind of keep it in the public eye? Uh, look, it was fairly easy to keep it in the public eye because, you know, anybody growing up in that awful period, you know, that, that had children, it, it basically changed the psyche of parents. You, know, you stop letting your kid walk to the corner shop. That's it. it, it it really was a terrifying time to be in Melbourne and it wasn't difficult to keep coming up with different angles. Um, you know, fortunately F Phyllis Chan was, was initially quite happy to be interviewed a few different times and, uh, and, and police kept coming up with different angles. You know, then you've got the anniversary, you've got the six month anniversary, you've got the one year anniversary. And as I say, I, I, I continued to do things. And the biggest one I did was for the 25th anniversary where for the, in 2016, where for the first time I, I obtained a lot of information that had never been made public before, including the names and identities of the seven suspects that were left. The After, so yeah. basically Operation Spectrum closed. They had, they had a, a, a rough list, of, a short list of 20 people, that they, of which seven were more likely. All of them had the propensity to do it, which is scary. That, that when you think there's, there's 27 people, the police have the, think, have the propensity to you know, kidnap girls and uh, from from their bedrooms, uh, that had never been revealed before. It was the Sierra Files, it was called, yeah. and, and I did a massive piece. And and one of those seven is uh, uh, the self-confessed prime suspect, and I tracked him down and spoke to him. Um, and certainly, yeah. David Sprague, who was the head of the force, believes this particular man, who's now seventy-nine years old and is a former Melbourne University lecturer, um, he believes he's the prime suspect. Other detectives just put him alongside the other six. But again, because so little is known, but I mean, there's no fingerprints, there's no DNA, there's no. Yeah. So, so how, but certainly, Dave Spray got is telling them uh, that this man is the prime suspect. And when I interviewed, interv interviewed him, um, he admitted that yes, he knew he was the prime suspect. And every time there's a similar case, like when Bunks or Boone, the 13-year-old girl from Baronia, was abducted, 
I think he's raided his house um, the next day. And after yeah. after the Carmen Chan case, and he was already on the radar because he, he, he'd, he'd been sent to jail for 10 years in the 1970s for attacks on uh, six girls. So he had priors. Uh, so he was an obvious person to be on the list. When they raided his house uh, in, his, in the attic, they found a, a balaclava and a, and a knife, both of which okay. are the type of tools that Mr. Krul was using. So yeah. very good reasons why he's the prime suspect and he came this close to getting charged. But in the end, the prosecutors just decided that there wasn't enough to get him con convicted because obviously beyond reasonable doubt is a big hurdle to get over. Uh, exactly right. So when speaking of, of the Sierra files, like, was there ever a part of you like that kind of felt apprehensive that if this were to come out that you would find inevitable closure or was it more so along the lines of these suspects are the ones that's going to be kind of haunted for the rest of their lives as suspects knowing that um they you know could strike again but never knowing like are these the suspects like, how did you feel about the sierra files being inconclusive to in the end Look, I had n no qualms in releasing almost everything that was in the Sierra Files because I've got a good report with Victoria Police and I would never knowingly jeopardise an ongoing investigation. So basically, I didn't get the files officially. I got them from a source. But I then went to um, the longest serving member of the Spectrum Task Force, who's a very senior Victoria Police officer, uh, and still is. And I said, look, I've got this stuff. After 25 years, surely it's time to bring some new stuff out that's never been published because, you know, you didn't really need somebody. And I struck up a deal with him that, that I would write my very long article, but I would let him read it. And if there was anything in there that he said, oh, Keith, we really need to leave that out, it would, it would, it would you know, jeopardise an investigation. And then I would leave it out. And look, there were a couple of things in there that I, that I did leave out, including uh, I had originally named the, uh, the Melbourne University lecturer, former, in my article, but at the request of Victoria Police, I left that out. And I can see the reasons why, in that, you know, obviously they're concerned about vigilantism and, you know, how would I feel if the day after I published this, um, a crowd of people go around and give them a good beating. Um, you know, so, you know, you not that I have a great deal of sympathy for somebody that's already either guilty of doing nasty things to six other girls, but, you know, mm. the police didn't, and I say because I didn't want to jeopardise the investigation, I did agree to that, and there's obviously some, and nor did I go into the details of uh, the attacks on the girls. And mm. it, it, something you should remember is uh, it's illegal in Victoria to identify sexual assault victims, um, which is why... Uh, and I'm not saying whether, Nic whether Nicola Linus and Sean Wills were sexually assaulted, but they've never been referred to as such in any respectable media. I certainly never have. Um, they're referred to as being kidnapped or abducted and assaulted. In that, in that as I say, neither of those girls have given their permission to, uh, to be identified. Um, so, you know, we, we've never said whether they were or whether they weren't. It's, uh, so that's just something you should probably be careful of as well. You certainly should be, shouldn't be yeah. said, uh, because I've said it. Yeah. You're probably aware in, in the last few weeks there's been some discussion that uh, it's, it's traditionally been that you, you can only identify sexual assault victims if you've got their permission to do so. Yeah. In, in some sort of date now, in that you're probably aware there's been a, a new legislation. Very big change, yeah. Which yeah. Is quite controversial. Was it quite controversial as well, given how? Well, like, yes. mm. I certainly think that, that that any any victim should be allowed to identify themselves. One hundred percent. Want to, yeah. but, but obviously they they, they should be so made public if they don't want them made public. Yeah. Well, speaking of, I read your piece on Robert Keith Knight as a potential suspect, and there are definitely some similarities in behaviour with Mr. Krull. What were the inconsistencies between the Mr. Krull case and Knight's pattern that ruled him out as a definitive suspect? Because you, yeah. you guys were so close to, like, kind of yeah. getting him. Yeah, no, he, he didn't even make it in the end to the, to, to the, the, the seven Syria yeah, files. Right. Um, yes, yeah. he had similar propensities, but basically they were, they were able to establish through, you know, various detective methods, credit card statements, um, you know, photographic evidence that, he, that he, 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 couldn't, he couldn't possibly have been in the area to do some of the attacks and therefore they were, they were able to rule him out as, as, as far as they could. I mean, I haven't really been able to rule many people out 100% um, simply because 
there is so little evidence. I mean, it is incredible for somebody to do the sort of things he was doing and not leave any evidence behind. I think that's what's so interesting about it. That's what I think seeing it from a journalistic perspective 30 years later, you know, like that's exactly what would be my angle is the fact that this guy is so clever leaving red herrings behind. At, when the meet, when it kind of, the case kind of caught nationwide attention in that regard and, you know, especially if as a journalist you've been trained to kind of set your personal biases aside and personal feelings in order to achieve a sense of true journalistic objectivity in every piece. And I know when I was doing my own research on the case that it definitely affected me because these are the suburbs that are surrounding my areas, for example, and this is 30 years later. And I think that's something that was quite challenging for me to kind of overcome. In your opinion, like did the Mr. Christ, did the Mr. Cruel case affect you personally? And if so, how? Oh, look, it certainly did. I'm a, I'm a father of four myself. And, uh, and a person I got particularly close to was, was Sharon Wills's father, John. And, and just to set the scene, John and his wife are fast asleep in bed. Um, Sharon and her three sisters were in another bedroom, all in the same room, fast asleep. In the middle of the night, Mr. Cruel breaks into the house in Ringwood. And the first thing John Wills knows, he wakes up and he's got a gun held to his head. And Mr. Cruel says, you're not going to do anything stupid, are you? Um, he then ties up mum and dad. He then goes into the girl's bedroom, lifts Sharon Wills off the bed and takes her away and keeps her for 18 hours and then releases her. Um, I'm roughly the same age as, 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 as John and we both have four children and we formed a bit of a bond. I, again, never intruded, but interviewed him at his request a couple of times and did some big stories on it. But he then talked to just ringing me every now and again and said, oh, have you got time for a coffee? And I would go and meet him at a McDonald's and would have a coffee and we would both end up crying because he would say, Keith, I was the man of the house. It was my job to protect my wife and my four children and I failed. And I said to John, John, he had a gun to your head. If you tried to fight, it could have been a bloodbath. Any expert anywhere in the world will tell you it's not like the movies. You can't just go whoosh and, you know, and, and, and uh, he did exactly what police would tell you to do in those circumstances. And that is obey the requests. Do what you're told to try and keep everybody alive. But you can also see, some, you know, he, he felt that he was the protector and it really tore and tore and tore at him over the years. And he got very depressed about it. And, um, you know, it, it, it affected me each time I saw him in that, I'm, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a professional psychologist, but he was reluctant to talk to his family about it. He was reluctant to seek professional help. And I guess I was speaking to him, not as a journalist, I never wrote any of that. I was speaking to him as another human being that he reached out to. And I just thought, well, you know, it's three hours out of my time. Of course, I'll go and see him and let him talk. But he, yeah, look, it really tore him apart. Um, and Sharon actually copes a lot better than, than him. Um, you know, Sharon was, you know, I've had contact with other members of the family that say, look, thanks, Keith, for talking to John. It really does in the world of good. I just wish he would talk to us or he, or he would, you know, seek, seek other help. So, yes, look, of course, you know, you, you can't separate yourself from, you're not just a journalist, you're a father and you're a human being. And, uh, yes, it, uh, it and other cases involving children, the Kelly Mabry case is another one I've covered a lot of, is something that even now sends shivers down my spine from, from having seen her body lying in the gutter. Is there a difference in the way you write about a cold case than you do a solved one? Yes, there is, because um, I think it's much more important to write about cold cases because something you write might be what solves it. And certainly I've been involved in a couple of cases and I know other journalists where something that they've specifically written or exposed has resulted in that one call to Crime Stoppers and an arrest follows. And it's a really good feeling to have to have that. And it's, it's why I've, I've certainly specialised in writing about cold cases. Um, I mean, yes, you, you, it's, I sometimes think it's a bit gratuitous to keep writing about cases that are solved and that what's the point? All, all you're doing is you might be giving the perpetrator in jail a chance to wander around, beating his chest, you know, oh, look, the Herald Sun's still writing about me, you know, I mean, bloody Carl Williams and those sort of people are, uh, you know, they, they reveled in some of the media attention. Julian Knight's another one that absolutely loved the attention and, uh, and, you know, that's obviously a case that's solved. I'd much rather spend my time, as would most homicide squad detectives, they're quite happy to help with cold cases because, you know, they also want somebody to pick up the phone and ring Crime Stoppers because an awful lot of crimes got solved that way. Mm. 
Well, speaking of, if the Mr. Cruel case happened in today's age of technological advancements and no doubt social media being an influence either in aiding or solving a crime, do you think it'd be easier or harder to catch in this situation? Oh, look, it would be a lot easier in that, uh, in that and I have written this, written about this in, in the book. Um, anybody committing these sort of crimes obviously gets better at it the longer they do it. So any mistakes he made are much more likely to have been made in those early days, um, you know, in the 80s when he started attacking people. Uh, when Operation Spectrum was formed, and it wasn't formed until after Common Chan, so basically there's a lot of crimes. Dave Sprague was horrified to find that a number of exhibits, including um, a rope that was used to tie somebody in 1985, uh, had just been thrown in a bag and put in a policeman's locker. It stayed there for two or three years and then that policeman moved somewhere else and then somebody else was cleaning out the locker and didn't know what that bit of rope was so just chucked it out. Um, there was a lot of evidence that, that, that might have caught Mr. Krull a lot earlier that, um, that, that, that if that happened now, it, you know, it would, anything would just be kept, it would be photographed, it'd be you know, much more likely to be, to be DNA and, and, and whilst we say there was no DNA from what he did, DNA collected collecting skills um, were nowhere near as good back then. So, you know, if, for example, um, Sharon Wills had been dumped in Ringwood now, wrapped in green garbage bags after she'd been showered and bathed, they still might have found something. Whereas back in 1988, of course, she was examined and looked, but they couldn't find anything. But, you know, obviously, forensic tools have increased a lot better. Um, and also, he obviously went into the houses to take the girls and Yes, he wore gloves, um, but you know there's, there's been incredible advances in you know it, it, now if a forensic team went into one of those houses now where the girls were taken, there's a much better chance that they would find something, a drop of sweat that comes off his brow, that lands on the carpet. No way in 1988 or 1990 would anybody have ever found that, whereas you'd like to think now it's possible. Yes, I, I certainly think if Mr. Krull offended again tomorrow, which much more likely to be would have been caught and, and had the principles and, and it was actually one of the good things to come out of Operation Spectrum was it didn't catch Mr. Crew. A lot of, it, it prompted a lot of changes because basically Dave Sprague and others said this can never happen again and, and new rules and regulations were come in to make sure that you know a copper couldn't just get a bit of rope that had been used to tie a victim and chuck it at his locker. Um, you know it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot better now so yeah I, I don't think he would get away with it as easily now. See, that's the thing I find that so interesting about this whole thing is the fact that, yes, to your point, like I do agree, it, it would be a lot easier to catch. But I think for me also, he'd be more likely to strike now if it was the case considering we're in that, I'm um, feeling in that sense of kind of back in 1988, 1989, before the Mr. Cool case, in a sense that children nowadays, especially having a lot more freedom again of being out in the street because, you know, they have like a phone in their hand, which is so easy and so convenient, right? which is the whole thing that I find so interesting about if he was alive today. Um, do you think like the case would have as big of an impact in that regard if that was to happen today, knowing that children as young as 10 have phones that kind of, you know, can call triple zero or, you know, have like trackings on the phones and stuff like that? Yeah, and also, you know, there was hardly any CCT footage back then, whereas obviously now there's, I mean, nowhere near as much as there is in America and the UK, but, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of, private businesses and private homes uh, mm. have, you know, cameras about the place. Um, and, and as you say, each, in each case, Nicola and I and Sharon Wills, there was other, you know, there were sisters in the bedrooms that, um, that, that now would have had a phone with them. So, okay, they're locked in the cupboard, but, you know, he, he might not have had time to take their phones off them. So, look, A, forensically, it, it, it would be a lot harder to get away with. Plus, the victims are much more likely, are the victims that, the victim's sisters or the people that were in the house are much more likely to have a means of, uh, of contacting people quickly. And the earlier you get onto such things, the more likely it is you're going to catch the person. Mm. Given that we're, uh, well, just kind of wrap everything up, just a bit of curious question that I have personally. Given that we're in 2020 now, where does Mr. Cool rank on your criminal blacklist? Has there been an update on that list since 2012? I haven't updated that blacklist. Um, that was just a, you mean the Herald Sun blacklist? It was, yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically, I, I, me and a few other crime reporters were uh, 
mm. were, were asked to come up with, you know, the worst of the worst. Um, what kind of, yeah, what went into that? So children would still be up there for me. And it, yeah. it, it, it's an offence against children that just abhorrent. Yeah. Like what went into the kind of making that list? Because I know it would be incredibly hard because everything is so objective, especially to the person's own true bias in terms of what affects them personally. So how were yeah. you able to do? Yeah, that, that's that's why each. I mean, some of us had the you know I think most of us had the uh, the killings of, of police. You know, the Bandoli Debs, the Silk Millers. The uh, most of us have that in there because you know we we work with police a lot, um, and most people included you know, crimes against children, the Kelly Mabry case was a, a one that I included. But yes, it does become personal and, and usually it's it's ones that you've actually written a lot about yourself in that there's a bit of a rule, particularly in the Herald Sun, like I would, uh, if another journalist had the running on a particular crime, then unless, unless something, I wouldn't go chasing stuff, like I wouldn't try and knock a fellow reporter off. So basically, you know, you, you, you're much more likely to include things on your list that you've actually written about yourself. Like Peter Dupas was on, Peter Dupas was on uh, Jeff Wilkinson's and basically, you know, Jeff Wilkinson was a Mr. Dupas reporter. I was the Mr. Krill reporter. And, mm. but, you know, so, so, so I didn't put him on mine. Whereas I, mm. mine with, a lot of mine were largely crimes against children and whether that's because I'm a father of four, but, you know, I certainly included a, a couple of pedophile priests on mine and uh, yeah so so yes you when you when you're asked to do something like that it does become a personal list and it's obviously not a, yeah. a, I mean, what do you use you know you but yeah I, I certainly see crimes against helpless people whether they be women whether they be you know men who are innocent and helpless or increasingly children I, you know crimes against children are certainly what get me mm. I think just to kind of wrap everything up, just to <laughs> give my team a bit of frame, peace of mind. Do you personally have any theories on who Mr. Krull is? Look, I'd be surprised if he's not one of the seven that, yeah, certainly there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it's probably one of those seven, but it's, it's nothing, it's not that I have any inside knowledge that's never been revealed. It's, uh, yeah. It's, it's but in your own, yeah, in your own personal opinion, with those seven files, can you eliminate like you know, say like a top maybe one or three out of those seven, or they're all like inconclusive? It could be any one of these guys. Yeah, look, it could be any one of not just that seven, but the, the slightly longer list of the twenty odd. But but certainly that, um, that Melbourne, there's a lot points towards that Melbourne University uh, lecturer. But again, it's it's largely circumstantial. I mean, yes, he had a balaclava life in, in the attic, but that's not enough to get him convicted beyond reasonable doubt. So look, yeah, I, I, no, I, I, yeah, no, I'd be lying if I said I, th I thought I knew who it was. I'm, I'm like the plan, the police wouldn't say that. It, it could be somebody that would never even questioned. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that, Kate. I really appreciate your insight into this whole kind of question. Cause I think it was really hard like, when we kind of formed groups and I presented this story because like this was 30 years on and I can't even imagine not having a state of mind on the parents and a you know, victim's family. And just to kind of see that these were suburbs, like I have mates that, you know, live in those suburbs that were affected now. And I can't even imagine what would happen if that affected today. So I think a big part of why we did this kind of documentary was to kind of share awareness kind of from the new generation is to kind of let them be aware that this case should never be done until we actually solve it too. So thank you very much for that. A pleasure. I wouldn't mind seeing the end result if that's possible once you're all finished. Of course, yeah, a hundred percent. I'll send you. Um, I'll send it to you as well. Hopefully, Evo would approve of it once we're done, and then we can go from there. Okay. And if you've got any queries, just email me. Of course, I'll send you a query up email. Thank you very much for that, Keith. I really appreciate it again. A pleasure.